we'll start the recording here. So first of all, uh, thank you so much for making it here today. Um, the seminar today will be dedicated to both the admissions program and to some of the points and some of the insights that we gained in five years of doing this. And uh, uh, the title of today's seminar is an Ivy League acceptance. What does it take? Insights from successful freshman cases. The first part of the session, which would be dedicated to um, some bullet points that uh, we prepared about the admissions process and the discussion of the admissions program that would be heavily redesigned. And Dr. Luciana and I will be um, going through that. Uh, it would be that part would be as important as the Q and A part at the end. I know that a lot of you had questions and specifically pertaining to the SAT part and the fact that a lot of the universities are moving away from the test optional policy. It's not like it was a surprise for many of us. Um, so we'll get to that um, at the end of our presentation. So we'll start with uh, about Freshman Academy. Uh, most of you, and we see some familiar faces from even admissions programs. I have no idea why you guys joined today. Like literally no idea but again we always welcome you so um just a few words about freshmen we'll talk about how students get in and we'll talk about the admissions program we'll reveal the teacher's assistant for this program and give a little admissions advice before going into q a so uh freshman academy and the discussion of freshman academy cannot be uh we can have it if we don't talk about the early days of freshmen and how we started. So essentially freshmen as a, an organization, it started in a, as a very informal, you know, as a, as a very informal meetings that I had first with my younger brother who was applying to a university in 2019, 2018, actually we formally started the process. And while he was at it, I was like, okay, it seems like you're a bit bored. And then we're meeting so many times uh, a week and for so long that it seems like you need like a community almost. And uh, we admitted a few students from other countries, uh, both from, we, we had a few Uzbek students, but we also had from Russia and Kazakhstan. And then it was basically kind of free mentorship or free support, SAT classes that were paid, but they were more, more kind of in a group setting. And it was again, very informal pre COVID. Um, Zoom did not take, like nobody knew about Zoom at the time. And that's that's how freshmen um, came to be. Uh, I'm coming from Uzbekistan myself, from Samarkand to be exact. So back in 2019, I mean, none of you probably remember those times. Um, it was a situation where 50 to 80 students nationally would take the SATs. And everyone who tried to get admitted into the Ivy League or get a full scholarship were regarded as some sort of a freak in a sense because there were very few cases and uh, those cases came from uh, TIS, from Tashkent International School. From a public school, there was no one on you know record uh, to be admitted into the Ivy League. And uh, oftentimes, I mean, uh, you, you would hear someone do it by going to the US and studying their school, but it's not like straight from a public school in Uzbekistan into the Ivy League or you know um, universities that provided full rights. So essentially, yeah, it, it, it was a situation where you needed to be kind of crazy to even attempt it. And then there was a lot of public ridicule that was associated with it because people were confused. Um, how was it possible that universities would pay for your education? I mean, that entire concept was quite unexplored. So uh, getting into the IVs was never an original, you know, sort of the idea at the time for us. Uh, our plan was to get in anywhere that provided um, a full scholarship. And I was a student at Yale and US already. So Yale and US was a primary goal for, um, for us. So long story short, my younger brother gets into Yale and US. Those other kids who were in the same group with him, who I was mentoring for free, they both got into Duke and Shan. And that was sort of where, uh, where, freshmen, where, where freshmen started. So now we are, you know, five years later, almost five years later from, from those times when it was really informal, where there was no structure, where it was just, you know, meetings with my younger brother. So uh, Freshman Today is a very different setup, is a very different community than it used to be. So uh, the cases that you're seeing right now, they're just a portion of all the cases that, that we had over the years. Um, 
We don't have Guzal Khan, we don't have Umid, we don't have uh, Rostam, uh, and many other exciting cases. So what is freshman um, today? Um, so first of all, uh, we have students who pursue education at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Cornell, Stanford, UC Berkeley, etc. And the list actually kind of goes on. Um, we have uh, students who launched or actively lead Central Asian clubs in almost all the mentioned universities. Uh, and uh, uh, this one we're particularly proud of because the kind of students who we admit typically and regardless of where they're coming from, we try to look into the profiles where students are genuinely excited about where they're coming from and excited about representing that place. And the fact that we have so many Central Asian clubs uh, starting is something that we're extremely proud of. Uh, third point is that we were actively involved in trying to spread information uh, as affordably as possible. And I'm seeing that someone is uh, eating right now. Uh, bon appetit. That's, uh, you know, the, I, I see the Uzbek patterns on the on the bowl and that just warms my soul so much. I have not been uh yeah no need to <laughs> no need to switch like that don't take it as a as a criticism or anything just i've not been home for for a while now and uh my very good friend he has uh a, like his wedding plan for june so uh, most probably i will be back home uh, by that time but in any case uh, bon appetit. uh so um our team developed the curriculum and interviewed and a lot of people some of the people who are here actually you did the interviews for brad camp we had fourteen thousand um applicants I mean, the Brad Camp did, and we were kind of facilitating and helping with that. And we selected out of that group 700 uh, students, and we developed a curriculum and delivered the curriculum. Super exciting project, and it was a physical event, and I was kind of managing it from Singapore through calls with the mentors who were teaching, and just logistically and everything about it was um, quite, um, you know, I mean, not not to praise ourselves, but I think uh, objectively it was quite impressive. And uh, of course, uh, uh, most of the work was done by mentors and um, uh, yeah, extremely proud of you guys. And uh, from last year, we started working with Chinese students. And as you can imagine in China, uh, the scene is extremely competitive and uh, still freshman's approach is something that is very valued and it's very different from what is offered in China. And this year we're very soon opening a, a office in Singapore and we'll start working in with Singapore students. Um, and uh, again, super proud of that because those are typically native speakers. And um, there's a lot that we can add with the approach that we essentially developed in Central Asia, working with some of the most difficult cases imaginable. Public schools, no international exposure, you know, and and the list goes on and on, you know, scholarship, you know, people who need scholarships, and this is an extremely challenging case uh, on its own. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're at right now. And this, all of those experiences in the past five years, allow us to generate some sort of list of insights or some perspectives into the process. It's not that we 100% under, understood how everything works, we're still uh, learning and there's just you know there's so much to learn about this whole thing um and uh yeah uh but in any case so uh dr luciana i guess this is the part where i pass the mic to you okay thank you valera hi everyone um so uh, if you are interested in studying abroad you probably already have an idea what the admissions are looking for uh, and first of all, it's your academics. Um, so your your GPA is very, very important. Uh, IELTS or TOEFL uh, to check on your language proficiency. Um, SAT, there, there is, after the uh, pandemic, there was a, uh, there has been a split in, in um, US, among US universities. Some of them decided they, will, they won't use standardized tests in admissions. Some of them uh, temporarily uh, took the test optional route, and now they are coming back to requiring um, SAT um, results. So uh, from next year, uh, um, several more universities will be requiring. So uh, that already gives you an idea of how uh, 
qual quantitatively how competitive um, that is. Just that's just the first um, fact, few factors. Uh, if you have a research experience, if you have um, um, won medals in Olympiads, uh, that's also great because that shows your intellectual capacity. Uh, next is extracurriculars, how you stand out through um, the additional activities you have done outside of school. Um, so MUN and, you know, this tutoring, SAT, IELTS, uh, many students have been uh, doing it. So it's, it's good to have, but it's nothing that would help you stand out. Um, some athletic achievements. If you are competitive on, uh, you know, national level, um, that's that's great. If you have uh, held internships, um, start, you know, um, participated in startups or uh, began your own uh, other kinds of competitions. Those are great because they show also certain personal qualities, which is the next point uh, that of who you are, right? That uh, universities can. Um, appreciate in your application. Um, then next, personal qualities, your leadership, learnability, you know, your openness to new ideas, uh, because that's what college is, right? That's where you, you will be experiencing, uh, exchanging, uh, changing your viewpoints. That's where you will be intellectually growing. So without, if you're stuck in certain ideas uh, and um, that shows either in your essays or in your uh, uh, extracurriculars, or in your recommendation letters, or maybe even in, in your college interview. Um, so um, that, that won't be to your advantage. And finally, professional experience. Um, how those uh, uh, give you a leg up, you know, uh, in the, the, the major that you intend to pursue in college. But these are, um, all great points, but by themselves, they don't matter. Unless you package them, you help admissions to make sense of all of this together. And through the story, the overarching narrative that you will present about yourself. Yeah, Dr. Rizan, let me just add a few points here yeah. before we go to the story. And uh, just to give you a very tangible example, and again, the presentation is called Insights from Successful Cases. So one of those successful cases was uh, our very first IV admit and um, the first public, uh, public school student from Uzbekistan who got admitted into the IVs, um, Umid Usmanov. And um, you probably heard of Yale Young Global Scholars. And today, you know, it's sort of one of those things that quite a few people do, quite a few people got admitted into the program. And for a lot of people, Yale Young Global Scholars would not work as a flagship as the primary extracurricular activity and you would probably put it as number four number five sometimes even number nine or ten in umid's case yale young global scholars was was in the top three things that he has done and he uh, you know he spoke a lot about what yale young global scholars as an experience gave him and interestingly he didn't even go uh, to to uh, Yale's campus because that was during uh, you know the pandemic and he could not make it. But still, Yale Young Global Scholars was very foundational to his story and was very foundational to his narrative. So whoever you know is saying that oh you know certain kinds of activities, certain kind of experiences, they are so overused. Everyone has them. To a certain extent, they're right, and we are always very skeptical about SAT, IELTS teaching, because virtually everyone has that in their resume. But if there is something that is so foundational to who you are, to how you think, to your experiences, to your view on the world, that you can speak for hours about it, potentially even that thing can be your forefront activity, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, when you look at freshman cases, it's not that there is anything tangible that unites all of them. They all come from different pub, uh, you know, from different public schools or private schools. They all come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, from different regions and geographies, from different uh, interests, um, whether academic ones or non-academic ones. There is really not too much that you can, you know, draw a line and say, okay, you know, SAT. 
1,550 uh, is needed to get, like, of course, there's a, ba a baseline. It's not that there's no, there's no baselines there. There are certain minimal things that need to be there, but there, it, it, again, it, he would hardly point at any of the activities that they did and, and say, oh, this is why they, they got admitted. It's a much more nuanced process. And the mm -hmm. process that requires working one-on-one -on -one and understanding what is your story, how all of those factuals, right? And in this section, we're talking about factuals here. How are they all connected? And uh, uh, I anticipate a question about the difference between full support and admissions program. Admissions program really lo looks into your factuals first and helps you develop those factuals, will help you develop your research experience, will help you develop develop extracurricular activities will help you look into your personal qualities, professional experiences, and so on. Whereas the full support is mostly focused on this part of the admissions process, which is uh, building your narrative and representing your narrative in the most effective way possible to the university. Uh, Dr. Luciana, do you want to start this section? How do we go about that? No, you, you can go on. Yeah, so again, like we said, uh, there are infinite number of ways to put your factuals together and prioritize on them in a way that will be compelling for the university. So a good narrative is one that touches upon the you know different parts about your life, and it does not leave uh, you know much space for interpretation. If you leave space uh, in uh, for interpretation, whether it is because your writing is not clear enough or where there are some holes in your story, you basically allow the admissions committee to try to think through those gaps and uh, maybe in the interviews they will be addressed, maybe not. So uh, you would want to control the way you present your narrative in many ways. So um, what, are, what are some of the themes that you would want to touch upon in your narrative? And by the way, by narrative, we don't mean just motivational essay. And you know that freshman is very notorious about how much we spend how much time, how much effort we spend on motivational essays. So in the case of Safe Law from um, this year, who got admitted to Princeton, he wrote 50 pages of reflections to uh, write his, um, uh, his motivational essay. It takes a lot. It's almost like you write a mini biography and uh, you try to understand what is the most, you know, what is the story within your bio biography and the way of representing your biography, your life in a way or... You know, you don't, obviously it's not, it's not a biography, right? You're not talking about all the different elements of your life, but you take something that is representative of who you are, of your social background, of, you know, where your interests originate or where the logic comes uh, behind your decision-making. Why did you make certain decisions? Uh, what is your thinking pro process about issues that surround you? How do you plan to solve those issues? And how do you envision your academic and professional growth, right? Those are the kinds of questions that you would want to touch upon not just in your motivational essay, but also in your supplemental essays. So how do you strategically organize that? How do you put things into boxes, prioritize them, and put them forward? This is precisely what, um, you know, what, what is the most challenging part. This is precisely why you cannot scale admissions preparation, and that's why it takes so many hours, and that's why basically any organization historically that, that try to offer services within the field, uh, those would be some sort of, you know, premium support, premium service, just because of the number of hours and the level of expertise that would be needed to mentor the students through infinite ways of representing their case. So that's ultimately, yeah, the most challenging part of it all. Not to say that the factuals are easy to develop, but, uh, you know, this is, you know, something that can, can be potentially a, a game changer in a sense. Um, what admissions program is, and we'll get to admissions program, it kind of combines the two things. So first of all, you're writing a lot of reflections to understand what do you want to do in your life in the first place? What direction do you want to uh, focus your efforts? But at the same time, uh, you know, you are developing that narrative. You're almost reverse engineering the entire thing where you're asking, like, okay, where do I need to be, first of all, to achieve whatever my goals are? Uh, with regards to academic achievements or professional achievements, but also uh, that would position me well uh, for the admissions uh, process. Um, a lot of people in the admissions program, and we'll get to that, by the end of it, they realize that American education is not for them, that you know they don't want that kind of style of education and it does not align with their goals. And to, uh, you know, for us, that's also a huge win 
we think of that as a huge victory because people potentially could have lost four years of their lives doing something that they don't potentially need. And when you think of you know a four hundred thousand dollars scholarship, it's not like this money is just given to you. You're spending four years of your life, which can be transformational, and they're so impactful and so important. So in a sense, you can think of it as what do you give on your part to the university? You're giving your four years of life. So it's not that it's free in a you know classical sense of uh, of of that of that of that word. It's it's not really free. It's your investment of time uh, and effort. So uh, I would invite you guys to think about it in this way. Uh, Dr. Luciana, anything to add here? Yeah, on, on the uh, connecting the dots, if you just give the university these amazing factuals, uh, they, um, most of admissions they have, what, 10, 12 minutes to read your whole application, they don't have time to make the, the connections. You know, if you leave holes, they won't have time to sit back and think, oh, how does this connect to that one? How did he achieve this? Or oh, he never talked about this point. You don't want to leave any holes, any space for interpretation. Of course, there always will be, but just minimize. And control, as Valera said, control your narrative. You know, anything uh, you can talk about in um, uh, supplemental essays or the personal statement, um, do it in strategic way. So you know what, how you uh, prioritize your values, how you show your character, how you show your interests, uh, how they develop. So when they read it, you know, they read your whole application, they just, uh, they don't have a doubt that they really want you. So that's how you want um, to present your case. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Zina, I, I thought of that one uh, quote, it's from the historical correspondence. I, I don't remember between uh, whom. I think those were two authors or potentially two like medieval politicians. And then it was a long message that uh, one, again, either a famous author or a famous politician sent to another. And it was a long message. And under it, there was a quote, there was a note. Uh, I could have written it uh, shorter, but sorry, I didn't have time uh, to make it shorter. So that's very I think it was to... Mark Twain. I think it was Mark Twain. Yes, yes, potentially. He I, was I reading really... to some other author. Yeah, you're yeah. right. But I, I but so yeah. it, it takes time to be concise. Exactly. To exactly. you know have a tight narrative and not wordy, you know, um, just uh, so it, it takes time and effort and many drafts and yes. skill. Yes. So in in a sense, I think that's uh that's very analogous to admissions process too, because that's exactly what's happening. You have very limited space. And uh, oftentimes when you're anxious about admissions, you know, and especially if you're inexperienced in it, you want to put more stuff in. But the purpose of the whole thing is to take things out. And it's it's easier to describe your life in 4,000 words than in 600, uh, 650. Because in, in such a case, you will need to decide what to put in there. So that's, I guess, one of the best metaphors to our approach which is, okay, we have this limited space. What is the most important information to put in there, how to prioritize it? And that's where we, we spend most of our time uh, advising people. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's most of the value addition that comes from, from freshmen is from strategically picking you know, parts of your life that are an interesting connections between different factuals um, in your life. Okay, so a unifying narrative. So we often refer to this one book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And um, that book, I learned about it in a, from a rap battle, actually. Um, from a rap battle between Aximiron and Gnoini. I don't know if you guys follow, follow that. It was sort of, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, that was quite popular. I don't, I don't think you guys <laughs> you guys follow that anymore. Um, but so essentially, um, one of the rappers, he studied at either some some Oxford, I think, or Cambridge, one of the two. And then he dedicated his entire, uh, like an entire attack or whatever, like the entire round to uh, talking about that book. And kind of he dedicated the entire theme was um, was about that book. 
And um, I started looking into that book after we developed Freshman's Approach. And the way we developed Freshman's Approach was precisely not to read anything online, right? Not to look into it, because if we did, what would happen is we would inevitably copy what's out there. So in a sense, uh, the admissions uh, you know, system is built in a way where you try to stand out and you try to do things differently from, from everyone else. So that was part of our motivation. So when starting to look into that book, I realized that it really mirrors a lot of the things that we independently arrived at with, uh, uh, with the freshman team. So essentially, all narratives historically, right? And you can take Robinson, Cru Robinson Crusoe, you can take Spider-Man, you can take any of the local stories that we have. They follow a story of someone who started in a certain place and was weak or was, uh, you know, uneducated or was uh, with little experience. And a person that goes through certain hardships, through certain milestones, and then uh, becomes stronger. And that transformation, uh, that overcoming of challenges is in itself, you know, is in itself the most valuable part of any of, of any story. And jo Joseph Campbell studies those narratives and then pinpoints some similarities between them, cross culture, cross time, cross uh, uh, geographies. And um, we actually moved away. And that's also the beauty of admissions process in a sense, right? Where something that worked yesterday would not work tomorrow. So you constantly need to improvise and, and work and lo logically derive new ways of doing things because as long as something, something works, more people do it and then it stops working essentially. So one of the benefits of joining Freshman as a community, as a team is that we're constantly learning. So in a sense, I'm seeing that others are trying to copy or try to do the same uh, approach. But again, it's, it's constantly evolving and developing. And it's very, very important that uh, you guys, when you approach admissions, you um, have the same approach to it, the same mindset to it that, you know, something that worked yesterday would not work tomorrow because more people would, would do it. So in a sense, I would kind of push back against this slide, this slide we developed it a year ago. Already from in the past year, we moved away from more or less the narrative style a bit in some of the cases where we thought it was um, less uh, beneficial uh, for representing the case. But in any, case, uh, in any case, that's one of the main ideas that we employ, the idea of representing that transformation, of showing what the milestones were, of showing how truly you have improved over time and how uh, you became a different person. And that time frame can be different. Let's say my college essay was uh, followed my life within one day. And I talked about my one day at the UN and it was the beginning of the day, at the beginning of the story and end of the day at the end of it. And I just talked about how I, be how I grew in that time frame. It can be a year, it can be five years, it can be a month, but following you know, that kind of a storyline can be um, foundational to your application. Lucien, anything to, to add here? Yeah. Um, so it, I would recommend you read at least the first part of the book because it's, it's such a classic. Um, once it, it, it because he he unpacks different myths, you know, from ancient myths and the contemporary stories, and uh, figures out sort sort of a template, if you if you will, you know, of how uh, different heroes from you know from ancient times to our times, what is the the narrative arc, right, of the story. Uh, that's helpful for you, whether you are, uh, you know, for, for college writing or just if you, you're into movies, uh, just analyzing movies or anyway, it's just helpful. Other than that, uh, that's just an amazing piece of writing. He's so skillful. And I was just amazed um, just for your writing. Uh, he is very skillful in the use of synonyms. So you don't repeat the same words, the same word, you know, from one sentence to another within the same paragraph, or, you know, it's so smooth and flawless. It just, I don't know. It's just, I learned a lot from reading and just, I was amazed at how skillful he is. 
um, and you just uh, learn a lot about ancient myths, you know, um, ancient Greek, ancient Roman, ancient Indian. So it's just, um, it's a very dense reading, but it's, it's worth it. But, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's good for you to mention because I think, you know, your description of it, in a sense, gives a glimpse into what freshman is all about. Uh, there are a lot of admissions communities, so to speak, and a lot of them are more, you know, you know, hyped to get those scholarships and to study at Harvard. They, I don't know, have photos of Harvard, wear like, I don't know, T-shirts of Harvard or Yale or whatever it is. Uh, and it's uh, typically kind of boy, boy kind of boys communities, you know, and uh, uh, I, I totally understand that I had that kind of boys group when I was preparing to. Uh, freshman is slightly different because freshman is in, in many ways it's it's much more uh, it's much nerdier it's much more lyrical it's much more idealistic about academics it's uh, much more uh, it, it, to a certain point uh, you like you know seeing Ivy League not as a goal in itself but as a stepping stone towards doing something bigger and I think that's why you know it's it's so valuable and uh, it's very thoughtful thought provoking but at the same time it might be a bit uh, melancholic. Uh, so there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, things that uh, that are interesting uh, about, about freshmen and its community. But in any case, guys, if you're thinking about some form of a group that everyone is hyped about the IVs and, you know, let's, let's go get it. And uh, uh, it's really not about that. Um, it's about really understanding why do you need it in the first place? It's going into all this like nerdy subjects and, and understanding what is your nerdy side? Like what, what are you, are you really nerdy about? And it can be anything. We had um, interests, anything from beekeeping to, uh, you know, rockets and uh, uh, anything, anything in between that. So in any case, guys, just, just a little glimpse into the kind of conversations that you will have at freshman and kind of people that you will meet at freshman. And of course, Dr. Vicente is the more experienced one, but I would say that it's, uh, it kind of trickles down to, to, to everyone. And the question of fit. So, okay, sure. You can represent your case really strongly. You have some really cool extracurriculars and, and your factuals are all awesome, but it does not end there. There's also a question of fit. And here I will uh, give you an example of uh, Parizoda, um, uh, who currently pursues her education at, at Columbia. So uh, Parizoda's case was absolutely fascinating because uh, she uh, applied early to NYU Abu Dhabi and then she got admitted and then she did not receive uh, a scholarship that um, was necessary for her to, to, get in, uh, to, to pursue education at NYU Abu Dhabi. And then what followed was a long list of rejections from, you know, university after university. And, and at some point it was, uh, you know, it was almost like despair. And we thought, okay, that's probably it. And then seven days before the Ivy day, um, day when most universities release their um, uh, outcomes, seven or 10 days before, she receives a likely letter from Columbia. And the, the way how it works, it was the first likely letter in the history of uh, freshmen in our history. We never even knew that this, you know, it's almost like this mythical thing that some people receive. And it was basically like you open the page of Columbia's um, portal, admissions portal, and it would say, you will basically be admitted on that day, on the Ivy day, uh, something along those lines. And uh, it was uh, in many ways uh, surprising. It was in many ways confusing. Because uh, Columbia, being need aware, giving 15 scholarships. So in the end, she got a John Jay scholarship that is given to 15 students out of, uh, out of 57,000 applicants at Columbia. For some reason, you know, uh, Parizoda was the one. Um, uh, I mean, of course, we know the reason in a sense, right? Because she, she was a great student and then she had a very interesting story. But what I'm trying to say here is that the reason why other universities rejected uh, Parizoda was not, a, a, you know, because potentially that she was not a strong applicant. Uh, I assume that uh, what she offered, what she put on the table uh, was not something that those universities were looking for. And I'm talking about 14 other unis, right? So only one gave her uh, full ride 
uh, and it was the biggest scholarship in the history of freshmen. It was more than four hundred thousand um, dollars. And again, this just exemplifies how it's not just you. You can do everything well, and then you might not just fit within. And what universities can potentially look for, they can potentially look for a specific gender. You know, it might be that they are looking for. You know, maybe there are too many applications from, let's say, you know, female students, or there might be too many applicants from a particular region. So uh, th there might be those kinds of factors. They might be interested in particular kind of stories. It's it's a very, very complex process. So in a sense, you can do everything right. But then if, if the universities are not looking for what you have to offer, that's it. Unfortunately, it's game over. So that's why uh, if you are using... Uh, services of any admissions consultants or mentors avoid those who are guaranteeing you admission uh, because it's in principle not possible you can do everything right imagine if Parizoda did not apply to Colombia so uh, she would forever think that her application is is weak which was not the case it was one of the strongest in the history of freshmen and we would never know if we did not apply into a university that um, you know that uh, it was a good fit. And it's interesting that uh, it was uh, Parizoda's first choice and she dreamt about going to Colombia. So I don't know how it works, how that magical connection between university and the student happens, but it did happen in, in that case. Uh, Lucien, anything to add here? No, all good. All, all good. That, that's... Yeah. All right. Great. All right. So uh, now on to the admissions program, and we will try to keep it short because a lot of those points are on the website. Uh, Lucien, do you want to talk about any of the specific? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So we uh, we redesigned the curriculum uh, because with of the spirit of you know constant renovation, uh, seeing what worked last year what didn't work last year with, with our students, with admission students, with full support students. So it's always um, tinkering, you know, with, uh, with the curriculum. Uh, and now we'll have uh, more uh, double, uh, more than double the admissions, the number, right? But in terms of hours, it's more hours of uh, classes themselves. Uh, more hours of one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I would urge you, those who get into admissions program, um, come prepared. Don't waste this time because that's a precious time. That's an opportunity, you know, you have to actually get the pers personalized feedback and uh, grow with it, you know, improve yourself, your writing, uh, your essay writing, your, your reflections and all, all of that. Uh, will be really heavy on reflections writing because that's the uh, the foundation of your your future essays, your future narrative building. Those are the building blocks. Without those, just reading the prompt and thinking of what story would fit here, uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, but uh, like digging into your past and reflecting on. Uh, on that with certain directions will give you uh, the guideposts, you know, um, that would be, so you will be doing a lot of writing. You will be doing critical reading that would also stimulate you uh, think about certain, about your life and about bigger questions uh, around you. Uh, case studies, you know, bringing uh, you um, the examples of students with whom you can relate, you know, with, whose stories you can relate, and uh, maybe maybe even inspire uh, you to, um, to work harder. Uh, and uh, believe that it's, uh, it's actually possible. Uh, and SAT and English, if you choose to do it with, with freshmen, um, um, and we, we have the history of uh, our students, you know, obtaining um, high high scores after uh, taking our program. Um, do you want to add something, Valera? Uh, Just yeah, try so to, to the, be brief. Yeah, so uh, essentially across all of those points, everything 
changed except for SAT or advanced English. We did offer uh, it uh, last year and will offer this year. SAT and advanced English classes will be also in smaller groups. We'll have 12 students all across freshmen, and that would be um, the number of students across different short programs and long programs like admissions program. Uh, we did not enforce 25,000 words of writing before. We did not enforce any of the assignments, and that was one of the mistakes, I would say, from last year. Admissions program from last year, it was set up in a way where, just like this year, it was before the deadlines. And of course, uh, of course, you guys are students, you have other things to do. And oftentimes we would see that people are not prioritizing admissions, would come, you know, not prepared to class. And it was really not the kind of setup that we hoped for. And students who did, they saw tremendous transformation. So from every cohort, about three to four students, they, uh, in the in the last year, they just, you know, night and day transformation from uh, when they joined to when they graduated from the program. So this year uh, we will sign a contract and it will be an official contract where if you miss any assignment or any um, uh, any class, you will be expelled from the program without a refund. And hopefully that will be, and we'll be very strict about it, just like universities will be. If you miss a class or they will be very, very strict with you guys. So you will experience some of that too, some of that pressure. And um, essentially, hopefully that would result in uh, whoever graduates from the program. Uh, guys, trust me. I don't know if, if any of you wrote 25,000 um, words of uh, of anything. But in three months. The, in three months. Uh, but that that is massive. It almost reminds me of the program I did at Yale called a grand strategy program where we would write 2,500 words every week of, but that was kind of a, a research paper. It, it's a bit difficult than writing, more difficult than writing reflections. So that would be very similar in approach and in style as the program that uh, that uh, that I did. But those are the, sort of the components of uh, the admissions program. Uh, what would you get in terms of the sections and in terms of the specific themes? So we have experiencing the Ivy League, Again, uh, if you read into the blogs and if you read into the people who, you know, a lot of people now are very aspirational about the Ivy League admission. And uh, again, I'm referring to the t-shirts. I'm referring to this whole ethos of uh, elitism and everything. Um, by reading the kind of materials that we selected for you guys. And by the way, curriculum will be entirely redesigned. There will be almost no readings from the past year. All the readings will be new, um, or at least the vast majority of the readings will be new from compared to the last year. So um, experiencing the Ivy League in, intellectually, experiencing the Ivy League through additional meetups that we'll set up uh, with uh, our past students will be extremely valuable because you will realistically understand what kind of system is that. And it's not really a perfect system, guys. It's not just being in the same classroom with the kids of Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk's or whatever. It's also uh, the kind of competitiveness, the elitism, the, um, uh, you know, the presence of intellectual pursuits, but at the same time, some form of uh, academic conformity that, that exists. There are a lot of nuances there. So uh, experiencing the Ivy League and understanding, um, understanding how Ivy League is, um, is uh, set up is, is extremely, extremely valuable. Then um, the second question is excelling in uh, extracurricular activities. Um, it's not just, you know, doing things randomly or going into doing Olympiads or gaining professional experiences. It's uh, also understanding what direction you should, you should take it into. So uh, bolstering uh, extracurricular pro profile will be uh, extremely uh, valuable. And uh, keep in mind that we use freshman network massively and uh, to be able to build those, uh, you know, extracurricular results. Uh, building your narrative, again, 1,800 words of reflections per week. And you understand how to analyze, how to leverage your journey, milestones in life, how to direct what kind of extracurriculars do you want to, do you want to uh, build. So that would be extremely valuable too. And Lucien, anything to add in this section? No, all good. Mm -hmm.
All right, so uh, gaining research skills. I mean, Dr. Luciana is a professor at the university and uh, she has extensive experience in helping out with research. Uh, we just did, we had this experiment last year where a master's uh, student, um, she applied to uh, our admissions program and uh, uh, she- No, she was undergraduate, but she, uh, she was a senior undergraduate. Yeah, she applied, she applied she... for a graduate program, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah she, she applied for a graduate program, so she applied. And then uh, her research, it was selected uh, in some very competitive conference in Kazakhstan, but I think she went uh, to Harvard's conference too after that. She got admitted to John Hopkins' uh, master's program. So you can imagine the level of research that needs to be done there. And a lot of universities actually require uh, doing research, like like Princeton did in the case of Safe for Law. And uh, putting the application together, so when you have all of these building blocks ready, ECs, when you have academics, when you have your story, you still need to put it all together, whether it was in the framework of Common App, whether it was in interviews or whatever. So um, th there will be a big section on that in the, in the admissions program. So hopefully, more or less, it makes sense. Uh, those were the components, and uh, those are some of the building blocks and some of the themes that will be covered in the admissions uh, in the admissions program. And just a quick point on on research. Okay, Sorry. I did the reveal. I uh, you know I did note. Okay, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I go did ahead. note who uh yeah that which slide it, it is on. But in any case, guys, now now you all saw it, uh, Rostam, uh, and um, you know we uh, tried at some point at uh, at freshman, uh, we were thinking that. Having someone from Harvard and Yale at Princeton in the team and teaching would be great. Uh, just literally, just someone, anyone. And we realized uh, very soon that it doesn't really work that way. So um, it doesn't really work to bring in a Yale people or Harvard people and by default expect that they would understand how the admissions uh, process works. Rustam, and you know, we kind of position it like, oh, it's a Yale student. But at the same time, the value of Rustam being in the program is not the is not only the fact that he's from Yale. I mean, also to a certain extent, but Rustam really deeply understand the freshman approach that we've, we're building in five years, and that's based on. And he himself was one of the first people who ran through that rigor, that academic and intellectual rigor, that is necessary uh, in the admissions process. So Rustam will be an uh, an immense addition, and he will be running the seminars uh, that will be happening every week. And he is very well connected at Yale. He had a very interesting adaptation to Yale. So I'm sure that he'll bring in a lot of stories, a lot of insights uh, from Yale. But again, I don't want the fact that he's a Yale student be decisive in you viewing him as an, as an important asset. It's much more than that. Um, it's more of understanding the freshman approach, is being in the freshman community, understanding what we're doing here. And uh, yeah. Uh, Lucian, anything to to add uh, to the previous point? I was I just wanted to say like this year the, the this year we decided mm -hmm. to uh, uh, begin working on research skills earlier rather than at the end of the program. So uh, you would, you guys would have time to actually write, uh, and you have to figure out time. You know, actually write and build your your research paper. Uh, because um, kicking it, you know, down uh, uh, when the program is over and that, oh, I didn't have time, and that, that won't be an option because we start earlier and then you have time to complete it by the time the program is over. So you graduate with uh, at least, you know, a, a decent draft of a research paper that you can use as an example of your analytic writing uh, to... Uh, stand out you know yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, on the uh, freshman admissions advice we have three points today read serious literature and not just read it for the sake of doing it in a sense if you look uh, in uh, i would say um if you look into uzbekistan uh, and the young people in the admissions right now you would realize that a lot of the books that are circulating, you know, uh, Nietzsche, you would hear something like, you know, Farid Zakaria, people are reading it, Michel Foucault, 
a lot of it is because of the freshman's influence and you know taking advanced english classes or admissions program or whatever and a lot of people are doing it you know in the sense it's aspirational sort of yeah i read all these fancy books but it's not just about reading them it's reflecting on them understanding where you agree where you disagree with disagree with the author it's a very uh it's a very serious um it's very serious work so a uh, read serious literature not because it just makes you feel good which some of you for some of you it, it definitely would uh, but also because you aspire to um gain uh, knowledge that is um, that is sophisticated and that, that's deep and uh yeah so absolutely uh and even uh, the you know i have another metaphor for you guys another comparison it's almost like going to a museum uh and uh by the end of it you're asked to write a reflection on that museum experience and if you knew a lot about the exhibits about the exposition you would be able to write a book almost you know if, you, if you're an expert there's so many nuances there are so many things to talk about and if you just go in for the sake of it you will not be able to write much maybe a couple of sentences so it's the same story it's the same uh, process in life where you're writing reflections about your life and if you know more you would be able to see more you'll be able to um to describe and discuss more about your life so uh, reading literature will help you in that. Dig deeper. Uh, sort of those two points are connected. Um, oftentimes the first reflections, the first ideas that you have, they're typically the weakest and the more superficial ones. And then you start questioning your assumptions. You start questioning your underlying points. And that's where, you know, that's where you learn, uh, you learn more. And if you have a mentor who, or uh an elder brother or sister who can help you with that um awesome if if not then um yeah uh, or i guess our mentorship or whoever mentorship but you kind of need a mentor here to to guide you through that and always have a plan b you know and we always talk about numbers so 50,000 students say apply to yale 2,000 of them get in 250 are international students and uh 250 international students get in out of this 250, who is coming from the same background as you guys? Public schools, oftentimes, uh, scholarship winners, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. No international exposure. It would probably go come down to about 30 to 40 kids with the same background as you. I'm, it would not be a secret that most people who get admitted to Yale or Harvard, and even uh, to a certain extent Yale and U.S., even though Yale and U.S. was much more liberal and and e equitable than uh, many other older institutions you would see a lot of uh, guys from the kinds of backgrounds that you you don't represent and i did not represent right uh, private schools typically um, lots of resources and uh, um, international experiences traveling experience and so on so you need to have a plan b uh, from uh, say uzbekistan or i would even uh, take it broader from the entire post-soviet space there are probably around 15 to 20 students max every year, um, maybe 30 that get admitted uh, as undergraduate students into the IVs every year. And I'm taking literally all the post-Soviet uh, countries. So, uh, and out of thousands of people who apply. And again, out of this 30 with the same backgrounds as you, it will be very, very few, trust me, very, very few. So have plan Bs, always be ready for the worst. Hope for the best, but be be ready for the worst. That's one of the uh, bigger takeaways of of freshmen uh, too. All right. So um, again, Luciana, anything, anything to to add here? No. All right, um, guys. That's uh, the end of today's uh, presentation. So it's uh, eleven o'clock in Singapore, Lucian. What's it's eleven p.m. in Singapore, Lucian? What's the time in in it's noon? Noon here. No. Okay, noon in uh, in Brazil, eleven in Singapore, eight p.m. I would assume, uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, guys, so we can do a quick Q and A uh, right now. Uh, maybe not quick. If you have really solid questions, we always love to. Uh, would love to stay around and uh, address those. I know there are a lot of questions about um, SATs. I know there are a lot of questions about the other application components. So feel free, guys to ask your questions. So drop them either here in the chat or you can um, you can just message it in the group. I will pull up the group, uh, group right now. 
so we can uh, look into that. Okay. There was uh, one on University Pit. I, I, Aziz is saying, uh, okay, so per, per private message from Aziz. Aziz, I will reply to you. I'm very sorry. Was a bit overwhelmed with work and messages, but I will get back back to you for sure. Don't don't worry about that. Uh, Olukbek is saying, please see my question about University Fit. I lost the chat because I disconnected. I hear so much about University Fit. Would love to hear more about how to identify one and how to research universities on glance when you have a list of hundreds of them. Um, Olukbek, I would say there is no uh, one approach to it. I guess the best way to go about it and the best principle to it would be to compile as much information about the university as you can. And it's not just factual information, right? Uh, the number of, um, there are some metrics that you might look out uh, for. For example, the number of professors and, and staff to the number of students. So what's that ratio? That ratio can be 10 to one, meaning that there is one professor to 10 students on average. It can be six to one. The lower the number, typically the better. If you're the kind of person who likes lecture-based education, then uh, the I guess the bigger the number would be the better. So there are no really, there are some numbers that are more um, universal and you would want like higher or lower metrics, but there are some that are also personal. Like, do you want to be in a more lecture-based environment or you want to be in a more seminar-based where it's smaller classes and you can ask questions? Um, uh, there's also kind of a vibe from uh, from a uni right? Uh, let's say Princeton, I associated, and there are a lot of stereotypes, of course, but uh, a lot of those stereotypes are true. Like I would say Yale is, uh, it seems like it's more uh, kind of, I mean, they're all inclusive in, in a sense, but out of uh, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and it's very, a lot of it is very, very subjective. Like Yale, it actually was the first university that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I will need to check that, but uh, it was one. Uh, it was the first universities that uh, canceled the policy of uh, student heights. So it used to be there was a time where if you were not tall enough, you could not go into the Ivies. And I'm talking about very early days of the Ivy League. So the you know Yale was the first in the Ivies that dropped some of those some of those metrics and allowed a more diverse student body. And I feel like is there a certain extent that kind of continue to this day. Uh, Princeton and, and Harvard, they also they have diverse student bodies, but uh, I, I feel like some are more elitist than the others, typically, because institutionally, because of the rules and everything. Some are more technical, some are less technical, some are more entrepreneurial, some are less. Uh, geography matters. I mean, it's a very, very complex question. So again, it's, it's, it's like holistic admissions, but for, um, it's like holistic admissions, but it's for you, essentially, Like right? It's it's you deciding holistically based on all of these different factors, vibes, history, what you're most, you know, interested, uh, what you're most interested in. Yeah. And if I may add, um, so there is a, this concept of strategic uh, objectives of universities, then that's something that you'll never know. As Valera mentioned before, if they want to uh, hire to uh, admit more girls, or if they want to admit more uh, more of first generation students, or more of some I don't know uh, uh, piano players or certain group with specific skills or specific social background, they are not going to advertise. Them. So sometimes you can get a sense of that by reading. The, the news feed and see the events and seeing where the university resources go, what's getting uh, highlighted on in their social media or on their website. Uh, so th those are not very clear. So the feed, uh, there are some, some things that are clear and uh, there are some things that are not clear at all. Even uh, like uh, MIT, I think, has this eight points or something, Who what we're looking for. And you know, as as, a, as good engineers, they mapped out you know eight uh, factors that they look for uh, in your um, application. It doesn't mean if you satisfy all eight factors there, if all uh, eight points are 
include it in your application that you would get uh, admitted into MIT. Um, so it's it's very subtle, um, but do your best to figure out uh, when when you read and see if it resonates with you, you know. Uh, and then uh, if it doesn't, then just it's just the school name won't make sense, you know. It it won't keep you going. It won't motivate you for for four years. Um, and about the um, the common data set is is helpful tool for you to analyze to compare, but that's a place to start. Yeah. Not to that's finish, true. just to start and see and compare, and then keep digging, keep digging. Uh, but uh, common data set uh, set might be a bit deceiving, guys. Might be this be deceiving yeah. because when you see the numbers, you don't really know the full story. Like uh, on uh, common yeah. data set, there's a metric on how many international students receive financial aid and how many of them you know, what's the average financial aid that's received. And on, on the surface, it's a great metric because it gives you an idea of how generous the universities are. But you also, you don't know what kind of international students do they admit. It might be just, you know, uh, exclusively private schools and, uh, you know, some specific kind of backgrounds that you do not represent. Uh, it might be that they admit the vast majority of them, if not all of them in the early round, there's just so there are so other uh, many other factors in those numbers, but still it's it's it yeah. is quite valuable. But common data set, yeah, it's definitely a place to to look look into. Uh, there's a question on whether we will be teaching or other people will be uh, leading uh, the course. So uh, Dr. Luciana will be leading the main lectures, which is two hour lectures. Then Rustam will be leading seminars, and uh, I will be doing uh, one on one meetings. Um, every month for an hour, and Luciana will be doing the other one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting. So about weekly, yeah, weekly, exactly. Uh, so about seventy percent of the time in the program, you will be sp uh, spending directly with Dr. Luciana, and then about twenty percent of the time, you will be spending with um, with Rustam, maybe a bit more with Rustam, um, but it would be mostly uh, in the in the group setting. Uh, I'm curious to know whether oh. the approach you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm just. I'm reading the next question, Luciana. So maybe. Yeah. Yep. I'm curious to know whether the approach you have adopted works for graduate study too. So, uh, so he's in. We actually had a case where a student almost like bullied us into helping her, and she became a very good friend. But at the beginning, we were very skeptical. We told her that hey, we never worked with graduate uh, students. Um, she was very convinced that she could get a full scholarship in the master's program. And we told her that this is basically not possible. MBAs historically had very limited financial aid. We did help her in the end. It was very difficult because she is one of those really um, perfectionist people, very knowledgeable in her field. But there was a lot of back and forth in terms of how to represent her case. And it was a very, very difficult process. In the end, she got admitted to UChicago to Cornell, to Duke, and three or four other business schools, basically all on uh, a tuition-free basis. It was a mind-blowing experience for us and mind-blowing uh, just process, uh, but it happened. Uh, we never did graduate admissions after, particularly because we kind of thought it's an outlier and also we tried to do things that we ourselves did and most of the people at freshman never did, you know, never studied uh, in a graduate school. So in any case, it, it definitely does work. I would say the approach itself is universal across. across. And I had a privilege of um, uh, meeting a potential PhD student. So uh, the uh, lady, she is a teacher and she's doing master's right now on a very, very high level. She's doing linguistics. And um, I would assume that our approach would work uh, would work there, too. Uh, when is the deadline of admissions program? So we set a first and we're already uh, interviewed uh, and admitted quite a few students and we're, you know, continuing to um, admit students and to interview people. So um, the first uh, class, it would be actually end of March. So I think up to like 16th of March, right? Uh, somewhere around that you can still apply. And if we don't have a spot, which is possible, um, because uh, we're still interviewing people. So we, we don't really know, you know, how strong the case, all the cases are. But if we don't have a spot, we'll offer you, you know, a spot in the in the next cohort somewhere around that. In, in, in April, right? 
yeah, in April or yeah, even later. So we'll have three cohorts this year, somewhere around that, maybe a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how how should I go about it? Um, uh, should I go from the beginning? Uh, or yeah, yeah. I guess so right. Just a, a quick point on the, on the the graduate one. So usually mm -hmm. for graduate program, you need to write a statement of objectives, which is a similar to personal statement, yeah. which uh, in a more but it's a more like professional uh, professional uh, with a more professional focus, uh, mm -hmm. but it still has to be personal. Uh, so writing reflect approach works. You have to write reflection. You yeah. have to dig for this uh, key points, you know, in your biography uh, to write the most compelling, the strongest, because that that would, that's your personal statement that will the same will go to all schools. And then there could be a second essay that some schools would, uh, graduate schools would uh, ask, you know, additional essay. But there's this personal statement, statement of objectives, that would be the same for all schools. So, uh, yeah, the approach works. It would be the same. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, if I apply to the admissions program and get accepted, will I be accepted to this cohort or next one? Um, guys, if you want to uh, apply for next cohorts, you can apply right now and then just let us know during the interview that you would want to do it uh, later. Uh, but uh, we would advise you to start as soon as possible. Admissions program is a kind of program where the sooner you start, the more time you have and the more perspectives and resources you will have to uh, prepare for college. So the sooner, the better. Uh, I would, and, and when it comes to admissions, don't postpone. Don't think that, hey, it's like in October, the deadline and, uh, you know, uh, the early for the early um, or in like first of November, whatever, or December, I have plenty of time. You don't because while you're sitting and doing nothing, there are people who are preparing, there are people who are building their profiles, there are people who are doing very high level research. So as soon as possible. And we did not talk about co-op program today, but you also can look into co-op. Uh, for admissions program, I honestly don't know how many people we can accept. Um, if it's a really exciting case and you really need some financial support um, and you absolutely cannot afford it outside of it, we will consider it. But again, running those programs is extremely, uh, extremely expensive on our end. So, uh, but with full support and we'll have a separate session on full support. We can talk about that later. Will SAT be important factor in the coming uh, year? And guys, uh, okay, so let's sort out all the SAT talk. Um, I actually remember the time where most universities were not test optional. So it's not like, you know, like those times did not exist and it's, uh, yeah, they did exist. So, uh, and still a lot of people who had 1550 plus on their SATs got rejected, 1580, 1590, 600s were rejected. Um, SAT is not really... Uh, a thing where you have a high SAT score and you're admitted, it's basically a, uh, like it's a guarantee that you will go into the next step and into the next stage. And in, the, in that next stage, they will look for reasons to admit you, right? So keep that in mind. SAT is not the reason. And same story goes for APs, same story goes for all sorts of academic achievements that you guys, un unless we're talking about research, APs also, you can kind of fit them within the narrative, more or less, or A-levels. But again, they basically uh, serve the role as SAT, which is, oh, okay, so that person is academically capable. Let's move on and see what they have to offer, um, you know, as uh, as individuals. So, uh, yeah, uh, research is slightly different because research, it also speaks to your extracurricular activities, your professional aspirations, your future. Right. So in a sense, it's both academics and outside of academic stuff, in a sense. Uh, but SATs, uh, it, they will not they will not help you um, in that in those later stages. Yeah, Lucien, anything anything to add to the SAT discussion? I know it's very contentious now and very. Yeah. Very no, popular. I agree. I agree that a high score doesn't guarantee anything. It yeah. just guarantees that they will. Uh, look at the qualitative parts of your application. That's all. Yeah. The next step. Yeah. Yeah. So a question: How long does it take your fr freshman admissions program? So uh, you can uh, read more on the website, and we'll attach it. But the uh, admissions program is uh, uh, three months long, uh, plus two months of advanced English or SAT, whatever the track that you choose. Uh, Mikhnisoy is asking: 
I won first place in the Central Asian football competition. Is it good for Ivy League universities? So um, again, so like we mentioned in the first part of the presentation, it really, it might be helpful. It might not be helpful depending on how you frame it. You can, uh, like I can potentially imagine a situation where a student could have an internship at NASA, right? In some very competitive NASA department. And then they apply to uni and even though it's NASA and it's like super cool, they have little to nothing to say about that experience because they realize they don't really care or they realize that they were just sent there because their you know, relatives or their family had whatever connections. And it does work like that even in, in, the, in the West or even, I guess, I don't know, say places like Singapore, Japan, you know, they're developed countries, but... Uh, to a certain extent, th that networking or how in Uzbekistan we, we call Tanish Bilish, right? It does work precisely in the same way oftentimes. So uh, maybe they were just thrown in there and they were just there to, yeah, to just kind of observe and, and do nothing. Then it would not really be a strong experience and something to talk about. Yeah. Well, Nazima has a lot of questions. A lot of questions from Nazima. Uh, have you worked with transfer students yet? Uh, Nazim, transfer students are very difficult. So we try to avoid those, but again, everything happens for the first time. We had experience of uh, consulting one-on-one -on -one consultations individually, uh, transfer students, but um, no, no, I, I don't think transfer students took admissions program. Is admissions program for aspiring college applicants only, or you open to students looking for guidance and academic self-reflection? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's not, a, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, cheap program. It's a it's an in, it's an investment, right? You can think of it as an investment. So um, I would not recommend taking it as some sort of a. If you have resources to the extent where okay, I will just use it as a way to improve and grow. Absolutely, go for it. But again, it needs to be. It, it, yeah, it it depends what kind of background uh, uh, you guys are coming from. But generally, I would say treat it more as an investment into your future studies and into getting a scholarship uh, or as a build up for full support. Again, if you have uh, resources uh, to build it up in such a way, but yeah, in any case, uh, it's up to you, of course. Is advanced English program go? Uh, yeah, Lucien, anything to, yeah, stop me. I just start. wanted to, a uh, quick, quick question on a uh, quick comment on the uh, transfer students. Uh, if it's a, uh, uh, Usually, there is almost no funding for transfer students in terms of scholarships. So if it's not a, a, a problem for you and you would pay, you know, when you transfer, then it's an easier case to make. Uh, but it's still, you know, for top universities, someone has to drop out for them to open a seat, you know, uh, for uh, and then it still will be very competitive. Um, yeah. So you need to have a very strong, tight, uh, you know, case, so that you are the one to fit, to fill in that one, two, three seats, because no one, no one in Columbia is going, you know, just to voluntarily leave, or Princeton or Yale, so you can come and, you know, transfer and take their seat. Um, so um, th those are sometimes more competitive than the, uh, the freshmen, you know. That's all. Okay. So um, another question from Nazima is advanced English program to be relaunched anytime soon. Yes. And we will post it, post about it soon on the curriculum. I cannot, uh, yeah, wait for the official update. We will post about it. Um, all right. So we'll skip uh, the questions that we answered. Uh, what's the cost, uh, cost of the admissions program? Admissions program is priced at $2,000 full support uh, uh, because it entails more one-on-one -on -one interaction it's $5,000 plus 1% of the scholarship. But again, if you absolutely cannot afford it, um, then uh, you know uh, we will have co-op. Uh, funds are limited. We had cases where students, they, they, they found external sponsors or they attempted to find external sponsors. Absolutely, we would advise to do that. Freshman has a track record that would justify you to approach people and say, hey, this might be a game changer in my application and would... would uh, help you with that. And we're uh, also trying to get some funding uh, from outside organizations. And uh, it's just that, again, there are so many things happening. We could not uh, prioritize that work. And we hope that you guys, you know, at some point, 
you might be helping us with it, or at least in your case. Um, like I said, most of the costs to the program, it goes to the mentors and to people who are involved in that. And uh, oftentimes they're working at a fraction of the price that they would do globally, uh, because for the kind of work that we're doing, if you take our track record and what what is being offered, um, you will not you will basically not find such uh, such prices. And part of it because uh, we really love working with regional students. We are coming from that uh, background and we want to make it affordable. But um, yeah, it's it is what it is. Unfortunately, alternative costs for a lot of people involved are very very high. Are you planning to open other courses? Yes. So again, you can. Uh, uh, yes, you can um, uh, follow our page and then we'll we'll post about that uh, very soon. Based on the new lessons learned from 2023, could you please provide one or two pieces of advice for those who will apply next year? Now, Dostan, do you want to specify what kind of uh, advice do you want? Like, do, do are you anticipating from us? Okay, maybe Dostan cannot reply, but uh, based on new lessons that we learned in 2023, I mean, we'll see. Uh, a lot of the cases are still in development, you know, applications are still in development. So, um, but constantly learning, understanding more about the process, uh, trying to make it more, you know, to start early. I guess the biggest lesson for me is to start earlier. I think what would happen is you will see people starting to prepare from ninth grade, from eighth grade. And I think what would, would unfortunately happen is that we will see less and less students from public schools, from those backgrounds that we started with, because there are so many uh, resources poured into that industry right now. We have some parents who reach out to us and say, hey, we have infinite resources, basically help our kid and get in. And if we don't think that there is any... Um, yeah, if, if we don't think that the kid is genuinely interested um, or has potential to get admitted into those universities, we have to reject those cases. But I would assume that uh, some teams uh, would not reject those cases. And you would assume that, you know, with resources, you will be going against those very well-resourced applications. So it's very unfortunate where it's going. It's becoming more um, competitive and it will be more competitive. People will start earlier. So yeah, but it is what it is. You need to be prepared and uh, it's it's a natural progression of things. Yeah. Lucian, any any lessons that you learned from, from the past season? Yeah, time is a, a double-edged sword. You yeah. think you have a lot of time and then you just keep postponing. At the same time, if you start early, it gives you opportunity to mature your narrative, to uh, bolster your extracurriculars, to find mentors, just planning, time and planning, you know, uh, plan everything yeah. and stick to the plan. Um, yeah. So it lo it feels like you have, what, nine months, you know, uh, or eight months till November. It, but you have so many things to do. So start early. All right. So uh, we have a question. Is there any chance of mature students being admitted? Um, can you tell us more by what you mean by the word mature? Mature as in uh, older students? Uh, yeah, so let us know and we'll, we'll be happy to reply. Thank you very much for the webinar. It has been really useful. Um, always, always welcome. Always welcome, Uh Do you have cases where, do you have case where the person get in any unis? Um, I mean, you can you can learn more about freshmen online. Uh, I guess people who are really into admissions, they know us. Uh, we just at uh, Yale, we have, um, we were uh, fortunate and privileged to have basically every year um, uh, a student who got admitted. We have a current, currently student uh, studying at Harvard. We'll have uh, next year, Seifullah will be studying at Princeton um, and uh, Columbia. And I mean, yes, uh, we, we, we do have, we do have cases. I'm 20, uh, 21 and some universities prefer prefer uh, young high school graduates. So um, one of the students who graduated from the admissions program is Farangis. So she is a 
a, f- uh, a fresh uh, fresh person, uh, a freshman at uh, Stanford right now. And uh, when she joined admissions program, she it was her second or third gap year. So uh, yeah, using your uh, definition, I mean, you you could have uh, you could have called her mature. Uh, but still, you know, I, I'm 24 now and uh, I'm still figuring figuring things out. I, I don't know exactly what kind of career progress I would want to have. And I, I still have a lot of questions that are not answered. So in a sense, when Ferengis joined, uh, she at, at the time, she was not set on, on the major. She was figuring a lot of things out. And after the admissions program, she did a lot to, to get admitted. It was kind of a first step in a very long journey that, that she took. Um, independently after and then uh, in terms of editing essays and doing a lot of work that she did. But in any case, uh, so that can be, you know, a case in point. Uh, so it's never late. There are uh, there are some uh, students, from what I know, who got admitted into IV's undergrad when they were 30 plus. And you can read more about those stories. It's never late. If you have something to put uh, on the table, if anything, it kind of helps you stand out and it helps you yeah, so absolutely you can. What is the main factor that uh, we will they will look and decide to accept? Same factors as we're looking into. Uh, we're looking into genuinely passionate people who have a track record of trying to be excellent in whatever the field that they chose. And uh, just people with a spark in the eye, people with, uh, 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 yeah, this passion for something, you know, and it can be anything. It can be coins, it can be, you know, building uh, whatever some it, it it literally can be anything. And if you are trying to be excellent in whatever you choose, uh, then and obviously there is some academic background that you need to have, English level and interest in academics. But yeah, is it easier to win a scholarship for NYU Abu Dhabi than NYU in US? I mean, easy is a relative concept. NYU Abu Dhabi typically was more uh if if you're a non us citizen it seems like nyu abu dhabi is just a bit more um what's the word generous i guess and nyu is less generous to uh, international students uh, comparatively speaking but nyu is a bigger uni so i would assume maybe more people get financial aid in nyu uh, especially if we talk about american students yeah all right so a question started to become a lot more Technical, uh, Lucien, uh, do you think it's uh, it's about time to to wrap up? Yes. Yeah. That's uh, guys, thank you so much for uh, being here today, and it was a uh, an honor and a pleasure to be around a, a group of such uh, talented. And I looked into where you're coming from. I looked into some of your, um, you know, uh, some of some of the questions that you asked, and uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, be very, very mindful about admissions. It's uh, it's not really oftentimes what you think it is. It's not as glorious and glamorous and, uh, you know, uh, hyped as, as it may seem. And as someone who has been in the field for so long, I've seen so many uh, dreams crushed, so many people who try to um, cut corners and try to... And, and it didn't work for them. So many people who had such big expectations and they did not work out. The entire the, the entire uh, field is extremely, uh, you know, you, when you go into it, you need to know exactly what you're looking for and exactly know the risks that you are taking of applying to unis. Um, follow good advice. Uh, uh, be very, very careful about what you're reading online because there is so much of uh, uh, advice that might be... Um, oftentimes contradictory and uh yeah good luck good luck to you guys it's tough it will not be easy but uh i mean it is what it is and um good luck to you all let's stay in touch if you have any questions post them in the group all the best guys if you have more questions or if any of the questions were not replied message me uh you can even do it privately uh take care everyone see you all thank you so much dr Luciano. bye bye